In England, in, in the UK, we, we learned German, German up to age 16. And for me, that was a long time ago. So, uh, uh, guten Morgen. Um, ich kenne ein bisschen Deutsch. Uh, ich heiße David Terra. And that's where I stop. The rest of this is going to be in English. <laughs> uh, I was also supposed to say, wer war das? <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> now, um, but I'm, as it says up here, um, I'm the founder and CXO of uh, a company called The Agile Elephant, which is a new startup. And my two co founders, Alan Patrick and Janet Parkinson, are over there in the audience. Wait, wave. Um, we've all got the same title, founder and CXO. We kind of share the C jobs between us, which is an example of how organizations need to, uh, need to change. Uh, I'm, I'm DT on Twitter. Uh, that's not my initials, it stands for Digital Transformation. Um, now, the reason we started our company is actually um, we, we did a, uh, an event called Patchwork Elephant about a year ago in London at Social Media Week London. And Social Media Week London is actually going on at the moment, but all the work is being done here. This is much more fun. Um, and at that event last year, we kind of felt that there was a change happening in business. Um, this was kind of a wave. And so one of the reasons that we started the company was because we wanted to either catch that wave or help push it forwards. And I'm going to talk a bit about that wave uh, in this context. Now, this is the agenda. And like Jane McConnell said yesterday, Bjorn gave me quite a list of things that I need to cover. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about what the digital workplace is anyway, a bit about how business is changing, that's one of the most important things, a bit about why we have to talk about organisational change, what are the concepts, what are the key actions in establishing the digital work case, workplace, who should be involved, what are the key recommendations. But actually, I'm going to try and make you think of three things. The first thing I want to do is I want you to kind of um, take a step back and think about this digital landscape um, in what, you, think, you, you already know all of the ingredients, but I want you to take, same, take, take a step back and think about it in a different way, because it's important. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say something slightly different about the organisational structure topic. A lot of the practitioners and consultants and people who write books around this topic are saying lots of things about the way the org structure should change. Um, I'm going to say something different to them. And then the third thing that I want to take you to get out of this is I want you to go away with some approaches on what you do next to, to make your business better. Because what our business is all about, we, what we really enjoy, is making organisations more effective, using these digital tools to do better, to do more with what they've got. It's all about value to the bottom line. So what is this digital workplace anyway? Now, my very good friend, Darren Hinchcliffe, who I, who I was a, at one stage a business partner with, is great at writing, doing really complicated uh, um, diagrams. So this kind of collects together all of the things to do with the digital workplace. It's, you know, there's lots involved. There's all this digital stuff, there's the existing systems we've got, lots of things involved. Jane put up this great chart yesterday. I've got version 1.0. She had upgraded to version 2.0 with some cooler graphics, but thankfully the words are still the same. Um, and this is important in that she, she covers all of the different dimensions of the things that are involved. But even then, I think there's something missing, which I'm going to try and add today. But that's, that, all of the ingredients are on that chart. And actually, in this topic, with digital workplace, and we have the Enterprise 2.0 Summit that we partner with, with um, uh, our friends at Congress Media to bring it to London, and we talk social business, and there's lots of other buzzwords. Uh, there's open business, responsive organisation, all of these things. What the hell are we calling it today? There's a lot of talk around overlapping things that are very important. But the key reason why I want you to listen to me is because and I don't care what business you're in, your business model is under threat. Some smarter, more nimble organisation is about to come around the corner and eat your lunch using technology in a way that you aren't. That's what's important. So, let's try and explain this in the context of what we call the digital enterprise wave. So, the first thing about the wave is we want to ride it rather than going under it. Now, the first thing to say is there's infrastructure that changes that have happened to do with outsourcing and offshoring and low-cost wages that have changed the way we do business. 
There's connectivity that's happened over the last 10 or 15 years with the internet and with Wi-Fi and with 3G and 4G that have changed everything. There are human factors. The, the barrier to entry to starting a business now is really modest compared to 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30 years ago, where any of us can have an idea and get started and actually have our company up and running, maybe in a day. We can harness people, crowdsourcing. Our kids are growing up digital, and those millennials coming into the workplace are going to change things. That's what's behind books like The World is Flat or Chris Anderson's Long Tail, where, where the, the way that we do business has changed, and we, we now have a way to focus and get to markets and actually sell stuff uh, with, at costs that we could never afford 10 years ago and 20 years ago. It's changed the world. Um, and that's at the bottom level of the wave. The next thing that's really important, and I'm, I'm, I'm a technology guy, I've been in the software and technology business for a long time, one of the things about Alan and Janet and I is that we've all been in business for more than 20 years and we've been doing the social thing for at least 10 years, so we've got a little bit of experience around this. My, my time goes back to the mainframe. I've lived through the mini computer, I've lived through the personal computer, I've lived through... Every five or eight years we have a technology change that some organisations survive and, uh, as providers and some don't, and we as businesses make use of that technology change. But in all of my time in IT, which sadly goes back to the 70s, uh, first time I touched a, a computer was an 80 column punch card. Don't tell anyone, please. Keep that to yourselves. Um, but we've never had three technology shifts happening simultaneously. There's a shift to cloud and web apps happening at the same time as the shift to social, where we're all getting involved in the market, markets of conversations, we're all getting involved in the brand. And at the same time, we're all walking around with the internet in our hands, the shift to mobile. It's amazing. Three shifts happening at once, never happened before, means the world of IT and the landscape is very, very different. That goes into the wave. Then the next thing is emerging technologies. There's new stuff. There's the Internet of Things. There's big data. There's ways that we're collecting data as a byproduct of what we do, which we can make use of, that we just weren't possible 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Artificial intelligence. Things, you know, IBM are doing fantastic things with Watson. So we've been talking artificial intelligence for decades, but now that's becoming a reality. It's something I can actually use in my business. And then there's 3D printing. And when 3D printing really takes off, that's going to change the world. Suddenly, I won't have to manufacture things in China and ship them over here, because I'll be able to do it in the office down the, down, down the, uh, the corridor. That's the top of the wave. Complication we've got is many of our organisations are still thinking in terms of business as usual. We have legacy business systems that were designed a long time ago that don't actually have as, as a cooler user interface as these wonderful web apps that, that we're using to do other things. In those systems is generally a lack of integration. Maybe our organisations have got into this social media collaboration stuff and started to build communities like I was talking about at that conference way back. Um, and, and maybe we're using social media for communi external communications, but often those communities are siloed and often the solutions are point solutions. We're not actually thinking about this as a whole. That's the stuff that's about to get swamped by this wave. So actually, we need to think digital. We need to actually start to think about digital and social inside and outside our organisations. We have to think of, of, of the business in terms of business model in innovation. If you're not actually thinking about the, your business model and adapting it and changing it over time, all the time, you are not going to be in business for very long. The smart companies are the companies that do this. And one of the reasons that um, we are talking about this is that there's a great, great survey by, there's one by Capgemini and one by Gartner. The organisations that actually think this way make more profits and are growing faster. So there's real reasons to do with the bottom line, which is why you should be interested in this stuff and be doing it in your organisation. So the other thing is that um, when it comes to thinking how you're going to apply this to your business, you have to have a way of doing it. We are big fans of the McKinsey 7S framework. That's what we use in our business because that actually integrates the hard and the soft elements of, of, of the business in a structured way. It's technology neutral. Um, it 
covers employee engagement, which is a really important aspect of getting this thing right. And it's a proven approach. One of the things that we, we are very hot on in our business is not giving away, not forgetting the past. So, that goes into the wave. So that's, that's our picture of the way this digital enterprise wave works and why it's important. Why organisational change? Well, there's lots of evidence to say that actually, if you're going to be truly digital, you have to change. We think the key to the change is actually to do with mindset and culture. And this is my second thing, where I worry about some of the current thinking on organisational structure. We actually need, the key to it is in this, the title of this event about evolution, not revolution. Um, we don't want to go to a communist state. We actually have to uh, protect the existing structures and adapt them to this new way of thinking. So it's an evolution, not a revolution. I hear people talking about holacracy, which is an interesting approach to running a business. A set of rules, a way of actually um, rotating the leadership, working in teams. Interesting. There are companies like Valve that have no traditional structure. These are the guys that are, that are um, responsible for the, the Steam online gaming platform. If you don't know it, your kids do. Um, the, they, they, they don't have a, a, a traditional organisational structure. That's the way it, it looks in their kind of um, employee handbook all over the place. Quite interesting. But that's not new. W.L. Gore was started in 1958. Bill Gore started a company which has no um, traditional structure. It's a team-based, flat lattice organisation. Um, within that organisation, leaders emerge in teams, and you know who a leader is because the leader has followers. Um, and that's been growing as a very successful company for decades. And it has these, these uh, kind of tenets are built into the constitution of the company. Fairness to each other and everyone, freedom to encourage and help and allow um, knowledge, skill, scope of responsibility, the ability to make one's own commitments and keep them, consultation with other associates before undertaking actions, very important cultural values. Another organisation in my country, John Lewis, it's one of our biggest um, department store chains. It's been going for 125 years. In the 20s, the second generation of the family that runs it decided they would turn it into a different kind of a business, and they made it a partnership where every single employee has a share of the business. And they have a, a constitution in terms of the way they run the business with leadership team, teams and, and, and a democratic vote on the policy of the company where all of the employees get involved. That's an interesting way of running a company. And that's something that was started in the 20s. One of the things in their constitution says checks and balances to ensure honesty, accountability and transparency. Very good values. Now, who's heard of Wirearchy? A few of you must have done. So my, my very good friend, John Husband, in, in Canada, um, came up with this concept, which actually is reflecting the way organisations work and the connected world that we now live in, where, um, as well as the traditional hierarchy, there are, there are other networks that form in organisations, and because we're all communicating, he calls it the Wirearchy. And in his explanation, he says... It's all about taking responsibility individually and collectively rather than relying on traditional hierarchical status. That's interesting. So, organisational change. Actually, I think it's not about changing the org chart. And I think many structures will work. One of the, we have a thesis, uh, a, a, um, a manifesto got to have a manifesto if you're starting a new company. Ours has 13 theses. One of the theses says there are no one-size-fits-all solutions. And we think it's not about the organisational chart, because lots, of, lots will work. It's actually about the mindset and values that you instill in your people. So if I pick out the things that, that were important from the likes of John Lewis and Gore and, uh, and, and the others, it's all about accountability and transparency and honesty. It's about checks and balances. It's about fairness. It's about the freedom to encourage and help and collaborate. It's about taking responsibility individually and collectively. But those are values that can happen and be instilled in any style of organisation. And organisations have always worked with informal groupings and, and politics and, and, and that kind of thing. You're not going to change that. 
That's the way we are as people. But you put those values in, and the most important thing to actually pitch this to the leaders of the organisation, to the CEO, whoever he or she is, is that it has to be about value creation on the bottom line. So what we're talking about here has to be increasing the revenue that we get as a company or reducing the costs. It's all about you know, reducing customer churn. It's all about doing things more efficiently so, that, so I, I can support my customers more efficiently. Um, somebody said yesterday that, actually it was Jane that said some, some, it's difficult to get uh, a business case and a return on investment. I don't think it is difficult. I think you can always bring it down to real value that these things are going to do for you. And if you can't actually verbalise what the real value is, you've got a problem, you've got to go back and rethink it because you should be able to put it into, into uh, euros for the CEO. Marvellous example of this, and I'm sure you've seen this, the case study, is an organisation called Grunfoss, 45,000 employee company, Denmark, um, pumps. Uh, I'm sure most people in this room with a central heating system have got a Grunfoss pump driving it somewhere. Um, that's an organisation where they wanted to get smart mathematicians to come and join their, country, their company, which is a bunch of boring engineers, and, though, and that's, those skills were going off and joining the banks and other organisations. How are they going to attract that talent? They had to change. If you haven't read this Social Business Cooking at Grunfoss book, which you can find online, and the, the reference to it is, is in, at the end of this presentation, and as well as these guys distributing the slides, by, by this evening they'll be on SlideShare read that book because it actually shows you how they've changed culture inside Grunfoss. It shows you their social business policy, which is signed off by the CEO. That's a big company, a big traditional company, changing culture and using this stuff. So when it comes to actually establishing the digital workplace, where do you start? We start with this McKinsey 7S um, framework to actually go through the steps to actually turn this into a reality for an organisation. First thing to do is to think about strategy. I see too many organisations who are tied up with the how and the what of what they do, and they've forgotten the why. Has, has anyone read this book by Sip Simon Sinek called Start With Why? Really good book, go and buy it. Um, what he basically says is, organisations tend to start with a founder or some founders who have a vision of what they, what they want to do. And somewhere along the way, they kind of lose the vision in the mechanics of, of, of running the business, in the how of what you do, do, do um, and the what of what you do. And somewhere along the line, you lose your way. A bit like Apple did when they had their vision with Steve Jobs, and then he stepped back and they kind of lost their way. He came back and brought their why back. Really important for you to, f to remember what the why of your organisation is. Something about the structure. Any structure can work to do this, but you have to make sure the information flow is fast and pervasive. You've got to streamline your decision making because you need to go to market faster. So if you've got an old style of decision making, your company is going to die. So whatever structure you are, think about the way decisions are made, make them faster. And there will be new teams and new cross-functional teams that you should bring together to do stuff in a different way. Here's another example of an old company. This one's 80 years old in the UK, William Hill. They are, um, yes, they are all about betting. So they're in betting shops and online gaming, online betting. Um, they are just in the middle of a major culture shift. As a company, they're adopting a kind of a Reese lean startup model. Now, they have product teams of people that used to be in marketing and IT and product management. And instead of reporting up on those separate lines, they actually have teams where they're all together to work on a product, and they have some matrix management where there's still a marketing manager and that kind of thing with dotted line to the people in the product teams. They have changed so that they, when they do a new product, it's start to finish from idea to getting it out to the street six weeks. And their attitude, yep, their attitude is, um, is Get it out there, try it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, we'll try something else. That's the kind of thinking you need. And so they touch their customers now within weeks instead of two years. Systems. Fast reaction time, really important. Old processes and practices got to be replaced. New technology. Whatever we, we, we deploy, it's got to be easy to use like this web stuff that we're, that we're getting into. And the most important thing is that digital and social has to be at the heart of your business process. And it's got to be about creating value. Staff. 
Well, you've got to get those guys on board. They've got to be supported by management at all levels. There's that Gallup State of the Global Workplace survey, which I'm sure some of you have seen, which suggests that the actively disengaged employees outnumber the engaged employees by nearly two to one. We've got a real problem about engage, you know, employee engagement. We have to do something about it. We have to get our, our staff on board. You have to change culture to include them. So, when it comes to um, the skills involved, they've got to understand these new, new policies, they've got to know what's expected of them, they've got to know how to operate in the new systems. Style, we, couldn't, we, sh we, must, we shouldn't be thinking in terms of digital tailorism, where all we're doing is automating the business as usual stuff that we do. We should be thinking in terms of being open and good for all. So you need to be um, at that end of the spectrum rather than this end of the spectrum. And shared values, um, you've got to go back and find your why. You've got to make sure that whatever we're doing, you've answered the question, what's in it for me, for the employee that is involved, and you've got to focus on the benefits. And actually, um, one of the things we, we like to talk about is military strategy. And in military strategy, we talk about special forces where actually um, no battle plan survives first encounter with the enemy. Things change. So actually, what, you, uh, what, what the, the special forces guy, guys talk about is commander's intent. Providing your, your uh, troops are well-trained and they know what the objective is, they will be able to improvise and work out how to get there. And that's the kind of approach you need with your employees. They need to know what the, what the end goal is and you need to give them the, the licence and the capacity to help achieve it. Who should be involved? Everyone in the C-suite. Got to have, have engaged employees. Um, it's actually vital that this kind of stuff happens with the IT department. Often the IT department has been a barrier to this kind of stuff because their thinking is old style. And I say this as, a, as, an, as an old IT guy. Um, so we have to get those guys on board because actually all of the systems of the organisation need to be deployed in this way. We need to connect this digital social stuff to the old systems as well. So we need those guys on board. Um, and we should think in terms of learning by doing and we should think in terms of outcomes. Here's another example. Atos, um, with, who bought Blue, Blue Kiwi, um, 76,000 employees, built loads of knowledge sharing communities, 30% have got um, active users posting 10 collaborative notes a week. What that's doing is helping them their, their bottom line. I mean, basically, they're saving lots of time uh, per employee by reducing the amount of email. They're trying to move to a no-email approach, but it's having a direct benefit on the way they deal with their customers, adding value. That's what it's all about. So, kind of in summary, my key recommendations. The first thing is go back to your business model. If you've not seen this chart, it comes from Alex Osterwalder and, and, and uh, there's a, a book called The Business Model Cam Canvas. Look it up, it's really good. You can use this as an approach to actually rethinking the way that you do business. And they're just coming up with a new book next week that's called The Value Proposition Canvas. Organisations that I deal with, um, quite big organisations, seem to forget who their end customers are seem to forget putting themselves in, in, in the shoes of the customer. I go to people's websites and it's all about them, them, them. And I don't see me as a customer being addressed by those websites. You have to go back and rethink that. Um, so, one of the ways you can start is by, by putting up a pilot for this kind of digital workplace project in an area of the business where you can see what the results are going to be uh, quickly and, and, and demonstrable. Um, you learn, you adapt, you roll that out to, to more places, and you ensure that all of the, uh, the employees benefit. Make sure that whatever you're doing, the what's in it for me question has been answered really crucial. So we think it's a very practical approach, and we use that McKinsey 7S framework to actually build up the blocks as to what needs to be done. There's some references for the stuff that I, that, that, uh, that I, um, you're not supposed to read that. That's just in there so that you can go away to all the wonderful links of the things that I've mentioned. And that's us. And thank you very much. Great. Thank you, David. Just... Uh, oh, you want me to stay? We, we still have some time for oh, good. Q and A. So. I thought I'd overrun by so much. No. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, 
which is very important or which is very essential also from your your talk that that solves maybe also the problem of uh, really getting one step further is that we break down those uh, buzzwords to a model that we can understand internally. Is that yes, right? yes, exactly. So uh, yeah. it was also uh, within your uh, presentation at the beginning, I thought, oh, there are a lot of buzzwords, but at the end, it yeah. was grounded by management principles behind that. So uh, you, do we have to turn back, uh, do we have to come back to this also in the discussions on Enterprise Now, And you've actually encapsulated it perfectly there in, in that, yeah, we're talking too many buzzwords and actually it's all about business. Um, these tools are effective, but they, we, we have to actually um, change our mindset in terms of, of, of the way we think about business, but it's the same principles. It's all about making stuff and making it more efficiently or providing services more efficiently. So we have to bring it, we have to um, not throw away all of the really good business thinking that's happened over the last 10, 20, and 30 years. We just have to adapt that thinking to this new digital landscape. The second thing I took away with me from, from your talk is that, um, well, in, in the early discussions about enterprise so and social, we always said, well, we have to go, well, the most people, the most important people to get involved are the HR people. Mm -hmm. But if I look at your enterprise digital wave uh, and all the technology things that are in there, uh, technology enables this and uh, as you said we cannot leave out the IT people at that point. So, so we have to get them together. So HR and IT to drive the project. Is that right? Yes. And, and I, I would say that um, uh, who drives the project um, it should be um, the business that drives it should be the line of business that drives the project in, in my opinion I think HR have to be involved because we need employ engaged employees and IT have to be involved because whatever new system we, we, we evolve has to make use of the okay, existing system. Maybe they're not the driver but the yes. important enabler. Exactly, for... enabler, yeah, yeah, they have to be involved. I see too many projects which actually move, you know, sidestep them and move around them and those projects can work but it would be so much better if we had IT and, and HR on board as well. Mm -hmm. Any questions? So far? Not yet. But uh, we will uh, have you on stage back uh, after the second keynote. Thank cool. you again, David Terra. Thank you.